Hi folks, welcome to this video on forces and free body diagrams. Okay, so first of all, we're going to start with a couple of key things that we need to know. Firstly, force is essential uh, to motion and mu uh, movement and the variety of different forces. And we're going to be particularly interested in these ones here, weight, reaction, friction and air resistance. And I'm going to show you how to use these and refer to these throughout this video. Internal forces are those forces generated by our muscular contractions. These external forces are ones that are acting on our body, but usually they come from, a, come from an outside source. Now, forces, all forces generally have five effects on a body. Now, that body can be the human body, or it can be shot in the shot, but it can be football, something like that. The five effects are that forces can create motion and movement, fairly common sense. A force can accelerate an object, so it can make an already moving object move quicker. It can decelerate an object, i.e. make an already moving object start to move slower. It can change the direction of an object, and it can also change the shape of an object. So when you see these slow motion cameras that you get in sport now, when you see, for example, at Wimbledon when someone hits the tennis ball and the ball compresses on the racket, or you see someone kick a football and the, fall com the football compresses around the player's foot, that force has actually caused an initial change in the shape of an object. So all forces, in sport in particular, can have these five effects. Now here are a couple of other terms, and again, if you, if you lose track of this and you keep struggling with it, wait till you've seen the entire video and it will hopefully try to, it hopefully will make more sense here. We can look at something called net forces, and that refers to the sum of all forces acting on a body. And this net force is also often referred to as the resultant force, i.e. the result of all forces acting on the body. Now, when we analyse performers, which we have to do in PE, we look at vertical and horizontal forces, and we look at the net force, i.e. the resultant force acting on that human being. Now, if the net force equals zero, one of two things is happening, okay? Now, it says here that athlete will experience no change in motion. So the two things that will happen is, if an athlete is experiencing a net force of zero and the athlete is already still, the athlete will remain still. So an example there is a swimmer standing on, on the blocks at the start of a race waiting for the buzzer. If the net forces on that swimmer is zero, he or she will stay on that box and they will not move. The other act of a net force equaling zero is if that performer is already moving and the net force is zero, that performer will continue to move but at the same pace. So imagine now the swimmer is in the pool and they are swimming along. If the net force on that swimmer is zero, he or she will continue to swim at the same pace until the net force changes from zero. Now, if the net force or the resultant force is equal to zero, we say that these forces, whoops, pardon my, pardon my line, are balanced. The forces are balanced. And again, they'll either remain still or move with constant motion. Now, if the forces are unbalanced, as it says there, okay, the net force does not equal zero. Then some kind of change, and apologies for my crossing out there, some kind of change in motion will take place. So if we have unbalanced forces acting on a performer, then the performer is going to be either accelerating, decelerating, they're going to change direction, or they are going to change shape, okay? Now again, it's a lot of weird terms, it's a lot of new stuff if you've never done it before. So let's try and give it a bit of practical application. First thing we're going to look at are these different vertical and horizontal forces. So we've got vertical and horizontal forces, let's have a look at them now. Right, so the two vertical forces that act on all human beings on this planet are weight and something called the reaction force, okay? Now weight... This is the gravitational pull of the Earth on a body, and we measure weight in newtons. Now, that's a big misconception that we have, that we measure weight in kilograms or stones and pounds. It's actually not true. Your weight is the pull of gravity on your mass. We measure mass in kilos. So if you have a mass of 80 kilograms, okay, gravity, you often round up to 10 meters per second squared, so your weight is 80 kilos multiplied by 10 meters per second squared. So your weight is 800 newtons. Okay. 
So weight is the gravitational pull of the Earth on our mass. And the weight, sorry, weight always acts through our centre of mass or our centre of gravity. And there is the equation there. Weight equals mass in kilograms multiplied by acceleration due to gravity. So you've got two pictures here, two rugby players. These players here have different weights. OK, one is clearly bigger than the other. So this person's got high mass. Rob Burrow here has got less mass. So this player is going to have a higher weight because gravity is pulling that mass down or pulling more mass down. Whereas with Rob Burrow, gravity is pulling less mass down into the ground. So weight always acts downwards through our centre of mass. Now, in terms of the reaction force, it's sometimes called our GRF, the ground reaction force. And it's usually, now here's where, again, I've not written it totally accurately, and I'm going to show you an example of where this isn't the case. But then for the minute, but it's nearly always equal and opposite to weight and the action of gravity. So, for example, every time you stand up, gravity is pulling you down towards the earth, but you contract the muscles in your legs to produce an equal and opposite force to stay standing upright. Now, I don't agree personally, but who am I to disagree, with this diagram here. If I was to draw better arrows on here, I would draw them like this. So the red arrow I've just drawn represents weight, okay? So weight, gravity, pulling your mass down to the earth through your centre of mass. The centre of mass will be around right here. If you're struggling with what centre of mass is, I've done another video on balance and stability explaining what centre of mass is, so it might be worth having a look at that. So if that is gravity the blue arrow represents the reaction force now look where i've drawn it the react that technically should go all the way down to the ground but it's my fat fingers not being able to get there precisely what we've done here is i've drawn the reaction force equal length and opposite in direction to the weight force now these two forces will cancel each other out so this is where we have a net force or resultant force equaling zero. So the athlete will remain in constant motion. Now, what does this mean for this performer here? If their weight is acting down and your reaction force is equal and opposite to it, this performer will stay standing upright. They will not collapse into a heap into the ground. That would be if their weight arrow was longer than their reaction arrow. But equally, this athlete is not jumping high into the air. If they were doing that, their reaction arrow would be longer than their weight arrow. So here's an example of net forces or resultant force equaling zero, these two forces being balanced. Now they are the two vertical forces. So we've also got horizontal forces acting on the body. Now the two that we're interested in are friction. Now here's, here's the thing I want to have in your head straight away. We always associate friction with stopping because, you know, when you've fallen on a surface, you've got a friction bear and you're skidded to a halt and you probably took a few layers of skin off your knee when you were doing it. But friction is all, also the force that drives us forward. Don't so forget a Formula One car, for example, it needs friction between the tyre and the track surface to drive the car forward. You have grippy soles on your trainers so they can generate friction and drive you forward. So remember that friction drives us on as well. So... As it says here, sprint cyclist tyres would, us would usually slip backwards as they rotate. Friction opposes this and acts forwards on the performer. Now friction, I'm going to deal with friction in another video. But friction is affected by the roughness of the ground. So something that is rubbery uh, is naturally going to have more friction than something that is icy. The contact surface, so if you're wearing studs or blades or spikes, you're going to have more friction than if you're wearing smooth soled shoes. The temperature, warm surfaces have more friction than cold surfaces. That's why you see Formula One cars on the on the warm lap winding from left to right. Just to try to get as much heat into the tyres as possible, and that's going to increase the friction, which they need to accelerate and change direction. But also the size of the reaction force. The heavier you are, the more mass you have, the more gravity pulls that down, and naturally the more friction you are going to have. The lighter you are, the less friction you're going to have. Now, the final of the four forces and the last horizontal force is air resistance. Now, air resistance acts in the opposite direction to friction. So this is the opposing force of an object traveling through the air. Again, we're measuring newtons as we do all forces. And again, I'll deal with air resistance in more detail when I, on another video. Uh, that one will be titled um, fluid, something along with fluid dynamics 
air resistance, that kind of thing in the title. Um, but the th things that affect air resistance are velocity. Now, this is unescapable, unavoidable. In sport, we are always encouraged to do things faster. Now, the faster we move, the higher the velocity we have, and naturally, the greater the air resistance we're going to encounter. You know yourself, when you're running fast or cycling fast, you can actually feel the breeze pushing back against you more. So the faster you travel, the greater the air resistance. But what can we do to minimise air resistance? Well, the shape that we adopt can do it. If we streamline, if we tuck in uh, to a set, or, you know, we wear the right clothing and tuck our arms in, we can streamline and get the air to travel around as quicker. You know, look at cyclist helmets for that. The cross-sectional area, the more of our body we, we expose to the air, the natural, uh, naturally higher air resistance is going to be. Think of a sprinter when they're bursting out the blocks. They're naturally low to the ground. There's a couple of reasons why they're low to the ground, but one of them is if you are low to the ground, you are punching a smaller hole in the air. If you're punching a smaller hole in the air, you are encountering less air resistance, so you'll accelerate quicker. And finally, the smoothness of the surface, that point number four at the bottom. If you are wearing things like lycra clothing, you're wearing um, you know, carbon fibre helmets and things like that, the air is going to travel quicker over you than if you're wearing baggy clothing that's flapping in the breeze. Now, if I come back to this diagram here, what I've quickly drawn on is a yellow arrow here. This is representing friction. So again, where you draw the arrow is where the force is being applied. That friction is being generated from the foot of the performer in contact with the ground. And that friction force is driving the athlete forwards. Now the green arrow I've just drawn, <coughs> just drawn excuse me, <coughs> represents air resistance. Now as you can see here, it's not to scale. I probably don't get a ruler out because it won't be exactly right. What I've tried to do is I've tried to draw the green arrow and the yellow arrow equal length to each other, but again, opposite in direction. So what you've got here is you've got friction driving forwards, you've got air resistance acting back. Now again, these horizontal arrows are equal and opposite. So the net force is zero, the resultant force is zero, and as a result, this runner will move with constant motion. So they will move at the same velocity forwards. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through that again and show you a couple of examples where the forces might not and will not be balanced. So we're going to use Usain Bolt sprinting as an example uh, as we go through these forces. Now, here we are. U symbol centre of mass is going to be around about there. So weight is acting downwards through his centre of mass. He's producing an equal and opposite reaction to weight. So as a result, he's not jumping into the air, nor is he collapsing into the ground. He's staying upright on his feet. These two forces are equal and opposite. They are balanced. The net force, the net vertical forces, sorry, on U same is zero. However, this is a sprint start. He's pushing back on his blocks and therefore he's generating a very, very high friction force through that foot at the back. Because he's also low to the ground, he's producing a very small air resistance force uh, in contrast to that. So if you look, these two arrows are not equal to each other. They're opposite, but they are not equal. So the horizontal forces acting on Usain are unbalanced. The net force is not zero because the arrow going forwards is longer than the arrow acting backwards. Usain is going to accelerate at this point during the race. Now, during the middle of the race, when he's got up to his top speed, weight again is acting down through his centre of mass, centre of gravity, and the reaction force, the foot in contact with the ground, is acting up. It's equal length, opposite direction. So the vertical forces, net force is zero. The forces are balanced. Again, he's neither collapsing onto the ground or jumping into the air. The friction force he's now generating with his foot in contact with the ground is now equal and opposite to the air resistance force acting again through his center of mass. So now the horizontal forces are also balanced. So he has got zero net force acting on his body. So how is he going to be running at this stage in the race? He is going to be moving with constant velocity because the forces are balanced, all four of them. So finally then, at the end of the run, surprise, surprise, weight is acting down through his centre of mass. 
reaction force is acting up through his foot in contact with the ground. They're equal and opposite to each other. So they cancel each other out. But look here, he's already celebrating. So what he's done is he's taking his foot off the gas. So the friction force isn't as big. He's easing up. He's not putting as much force into the track. So the friction arrow is naturally small. He's upright. He's got his arms exposed, celebrating to the crowd. So he's also increased his air resistance air force acting again through his centre of mass. So the two horizontal forces are unbalanced once again, but this time it's air resistance that is greater than friction. So again, the forces are unbalanced, the net force is not going to be zero, and in this part of the race here, he is going to be decelerated. Now there's one final example I want to very quickly take you through. In each of those Usain Bolt examples, the vertical forces were always equal and opposite to each other. But there are incidences where the vertical forces are not equal and opposite to each other. So let's look at this high jumper here. So her foot is in contact with the ground, but because she's trying to escape gravity very, very briefly, she's putting a very, very big re uh, reaction force sorry, into the ground, very, very long. That is smaller for this very brief moment in time. Sorry, that is bigger than her weight force acting through her centre of mass. But as a result, because the reaction force is greater than the weight force, these forces are again unbalanced. The net force would not be zero and she would very briefly jump up into the air. When she's over the bar, what will then happen is she'll have no reaction force because she's not in contact with the ground anymore and she will have a good size weight arrow and that is why she will always come back down to planet Earth as we all do when we jump. So here's an example, anyone who's got to jump in their event, that's where at takeoff, the reaction force will be longer than the weight force, or greater than the weight force, sorry. The forces will be unbalanced, the net force will not be zero, and they will take off for a very brief moment in time. Now I'm just going to finish on this. My two big top tips for when you are doing free body diagrams and forces on athletes when it comes to the when it comes to the exam. I'm going to underline these, I'm going to highlight these to make sure you are aware of it. Always, worst highlight in the world, always ensure or you draw the arrows to an equal length if you are trying to show that the forces are balanced. If you don't do that, you lose the marks. So the converse must also be true. Always draw the arrows. Let's see if this highlight is working any better. Slightly better. Always draw the arrows to an unequal length. Crucial if you are trying to show that the forces are unbalanced. Okay? You've got to do that. Look at the examples I've gone through with you where friction might be longer than air resistance and vice versa. Where reaction force might be longer than weight. Okay? So make sure you're happy with those examples. And so finally then, always, always, always draw the arrows through where they are acting on the performer. Okay, you've always got to do that. So weight always acts through the center of mass. Look at the picture that did, um, Usain Bolt. Weight was an arrow that was always drawn from his center of mass. Reaction force was always drawn through the limb in contact with the ground. In this case, the foot that was in contact with the ground or in contact with the starting blocks. So that's just as important. Friction, same, always acts through the limb in contact with the ground. If your foot is in the air, it is not generating any friction. It's got to be in contact with the ground or the surface. And finally, air resistance always acts through the centre of mass or gravity. The reality is it acts through every bit of your body, air resistance, but that's too difficult to draw. So we just draw it acting through your centre of mass to represent the fact that it is acting on your body in general. Okay, so this video is for forces and free body diagrams. Hope you found it useful, folks.